Thank you very much. Uh, delighted to be here. The future of finance. The next question, of course, is uh, does finance have a future? Yes, if we don't mess up in the future, otherwise we don't have a future. Like yourself, of course, uh, I was extremely interested when the whole thing basically collapsed, is what are, in the end of the day, the main causes behind this collapse? What has happened to us? Why didn't we not see it coming? Uh, and what should we learn from it? Because that's, I think, the most important part of it. What should we learn from it? Well, whatever happened, it was perfect. Uh, it was a perfect storm. A lot, a lot of people saying, but we believe it's not perfect storm. It was perfect, but not a storm, because the storm assumes it was not man-made. And in essence, I think what we did is we did it to ourselves. I'm an economist, and I also will talk about the economy as and how I at least learned it at school and university. And I can also see what I believe are the shortfalls there. And potentially, that is also part of what I think is at this moment a problem. I think we all use models uh, with a certain amount of assumptions, and those assumptions, to be very frank, were extremely primitive and, and, uh, and grossly inadequate. Uh, but not only that we had those assumptions, we forgot about the fact that they were assumptions. So we assumed that we were rational, we assumed that markets were liquid, we assumed that every behavior was uh, normal distributed, uh, and just name some other things. Uh, we also assumed that uh, people maximize their utilities, uh, which is also not the case. If we maximize something, we maximize power and not, not our utilities. So all these things have happened. And of course, in the meantime, we have, def um, have something which we can cover this for from a theoretical point of view, which is all called a behavioral finance. I ask uh, several students and uh, people in uh, different, uh, different times I, I, I held this speech, what do you believe is the course, the reasons for the whole crisis? And then people say, okay, uh, unprofessional behavior is, is a category of, um, of courses, immoral behavior, irrational, act of God, which basically means we can, can't do anything about it, or others. But m the immoral behavior comes out as I think, around 40% of the reason why people believe we are in a problem. So the issue now is if morality is therefore a cause of the crisis, why haven't we seen it coming? Uh, because the economy is basically a moral science. But what we have done over the, the last uh, century, I think we have made it a mechanical science. We have learned models. The models behave a certain way, and that's, I think, how we believe the world is acting. Uh, and morality in our science have become also very unfashionable. And therefore, we have simply lost our feeling of the, to ask the question whether certain behavior is right or wrong. And a lot of people, uh, people from economists who are simply saying, listen, that is even not a part of our science any longer. That is a part of another science. It's not nothing to do with us. But if for 40% of the cases, that is why things go wrong, and if we haven't learned about it any longer, it's not on our radar screen, then you can see that we will not be able to see things coming. We can only see things coming if we learn uh, what is right behavior and what is wrong behavior. For ourselves, but also for the society at large. I use, for morality, I use an example which, and I believe uh, this example works, uh, if you are on the on a tower, on a large tower, and you have a stone in your hand, you drop the stone, then somebody from the natural science would simply just calculate how long it will take, that stone will hit the ground, and do twice or three times, and then he has a theory. An economist will simply drop the stone and say, well, what are the chances I hit somebody? That's basically what economists do. Uh, and, and somebody who from the moral science, and we should be basically part of our science, is, is it right to hit somebody? I mean, are we allowed to put somebody else in danger? So there you have three questions, and I think we have never, never grasped with that last question. The next thing, of course, is, is immorality wrong? There's a Dutch philosopher, I think, from some several centuries ago, uh, Mendeville, who simply were saying, listen, morality, immorality is not wrong. It maximizes wealth. If you're in Russia, uh, and if you were Putin, you would simply agree with it, uh, because it maximizes your wealth, and morality is therefore right. A lot of museums, with all the paintings, have basically been gathered, have been collected also in a not moral way. Uh, and it is fine, because it has created wealth. But I think we have moved far away from that statement. 
The second argument is it's wrong, but invisible hands will correct it. I think society at large will correct immoral behavior. Also, that has proven to be wrong. And the last statement is therefore morality is incorrect and it needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed by us all, but it also needs to be addressed by a, in, a, in an institutional way. I have some moral questions which I personally find interesting, and they, some are, have to do with your job, some are not, not, but I still believe they are interested. I once asked a question to people, is it, is it more wrong to dump waste in the sea or on land? And I can also add to it uh, in, in the air. A lot of people are saying, well, you should never dump it on, the, on, the, on land, that's not correct. But this is the question is how close, how close by is, is, that, is that moral act? Is it moral act far away, then you don't care. If it's close by, you basically are bothered. But in essence, I think the, the, the answer should, to this question should be, it's wrong either way, but dumping on sea is just as wrong, and even maybe wronger, because you can never recoup that, uh, that waste. And another discussion I think came up, which I also find very interesting, is why are a host pipe of a car in the front of a car, sorry, in the back of the car. In the early days, the engine was in the back, but now the engine is in the front. So why don't we have a hose pipe in the front of the car? Anybody know why do we don't have it? We don't like our own pollution. So if somebody else gets it, there's no problem. We never care about our own pollution because the hose pipe is in, in the back. I find it very interesting that if you were to put that hose pipe in the front of a car, attitude would totally change. Question. Pay as you go, pension fund, or a Ponzi scheme, what's worse? If you have a declining population, a pay as you go pension scheme is a Ponzi scheme. It's the same. Nobody, so I think it's, you have to have a, also moral uh, uh, response on, on that type of, of schemes because they basically have Ponzi uh, characteristics. Well, everybody talks about Thomas Piketty. Pickett, Pickett, uh, and there you have the whole discussion, of course, whether you, we believe that wealth is correctly distributed. And the last, I think, is also for you very important, is apparently not so long ago, two, two months ago, there was a discussion at Harvard, whereby students basically started to protest because Harvard Trust was investing in companies, also in oil companies. But they found that they felt, the students felt that it was no longer accepted. You could put your money into companies who polluted the earth even companies we regard as, uh, as very good companies, but they really want to go much further than that. So automobile companies, what have you, oil companies will, should not be allowed any longer. So you see also there coming a, a moral discussion coming, which I think is extremely relevant. I always ask the audience a question, um, and the question is whether you believe that the financial sector is more or less moral than other sectors in the society. And always make the exception, of course, for the real estate sector, but uh, <laughs> maybe I'm on dan dangerous ground now. Well, you don't have to answer the question at this moment, but I think the, the, I, I could give three answers why I believe the financial sector has a, no, not, so, not so much of a morality problem, but there are more morality hurdles in the financial sector. I think you should be aware of them because they are playing a role, I think, in our thinking. First of all, if you are a doctor and you have a patient and you have just done an operation on your patient, I must assume you will look after the patient at least twice a day, and if the patient has in pain, you will, you will look at, you will visit them even further. So there's a very close relationship between a, a doctor and a patient, the producer and the consumer. Uh, and in the financial sector, I think that relationship more or less has been destroyed, because you are a producer of uh, subprime. Uh, uh, securitized debt in the United States of America and you're going to sell it to a German bank. You couldn't care less because it's so far away. It's the same story about, about dumping, uh, dumping uh, wastage in, in the ocean. It's too far away. So your whole system of empathy, because you, you have empathy with your patient, has gone. And the fact that we are so far away and removed as a producer from the consumer is a moral hurdle. Second thing is the fact that uh, our business is abstract. If you steal from a wallet from your, from, or if, if you leave your wallet behind and somebody else takes it, then that is stealing. If you leave your wallet behind in the financial market, uh, that is called making the market financially um, efficient. 
So there's a very different concept in, in the same type of attitude uh, in, in the financial sector versus the real sector, because the financial sector is abstract. The third, I believe, is important, uh, where we have a, call it a moral problem, is not, not the right word, but we have a moral hindrance, is the fact that our business is leveraged. Uh, we could go for a lunch because I promise you to, uh, to adjust the, the LIBOR quote with one basis point and nobody cares because what is one basis point is absolutely nothing. But still, it's the one basis point over a trillion dollars, and that's the issue. Our business is so leveraged that the end result, the effect on the market and the effect on society is huge, whereas what we are doing looks, I think, tiny. So there's three reasons why our business, the institutional reasons why our business has moral problems which we have to address. So we have to be aware that these issues are there and we have to deal with them um, because uh, they are relevant to us and, and society. There's one other reason why there's potentially a morality problem in the financial sector, because if you are a baker, you love to make bread, and if you are a banker, you love to make money. There's another reason why the, 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 our economic uh, uh, science fails, and that is what we, we aggregate everything up. So if we're talking about gross, gross national product, we have add, added everything up. But in essence, I think society does not add up. If you, have, if you have one soccer lover from Liverpool coming to Holland, uh, then that's fine. Having two soccer lovers from Liverpool coming to Holland, that's fine. If you have 100, it's a problem. If you have 1,000, we are in real trouble. So basically, you cannot add up um, by fact that, you, that, that there are more people or more entities or more organizations, behavior changes. There's, I think, one very good example, which I would like to mention, uh, and that has to do with that LTCM crisis uh, at a time in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the years 2000, whereby uh, there was a great collapse in the, in the sovereign debt in Russia. But what happened, there was no effect on that price of the sovereign debt of Russia, but there was a price effect on the price of the sovereign debt in Germany and in, in the United Kingdom. Because the very big holder of all the debt was LTCM. They got into trouble, couldn't sell the Russian debt anyway, so they had to sell something else, and they sell Deutsch, uh, the, D -bond, the, the German bond and the UK um, sterling. So complex systems totally respond differently. And, and the fact that that, 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 that um, response is very different, uh, that makes us puzzling. But it means that our, the way we have learned is that everything is li linear, everything has a correlation. But in essence, if there's a crisis, that correlation basically evaporates. Is everything doom and gloom? Are we effectively in a sector where uh, we basically, if we, are on the, in the, in, uh, if we have a birthday party or whatever, that we basically have to lie about our profession. We, we simply tell them that we are not in the business. I personally feel that our three areas where you should look at, at our, our sector, one of course that we are indeed for a partly, we have caused the crisis, which I think is true. We should also basically be so open about it. Um, there's another sector of, of events whereby we basically are, uh, we are culprit to a, a, a crime elsewhere, for example, if you do money laundering or whatever, I think we are not effectively the, the, the source of the crime or the source of the mishappening, it's somewhere else. Uh, but we are basically instrumental in, in the process, but we are effectively, let's say, not directly involved, but indirectly involved. But equally true is the fact that the financial sector, and we have proven that as well, we have from time to time be the healer of problems. And there have been cases where the financial sector has been the only sector which was honest or basically told the truth or was helping to solve the, the crisis. Uh, and I also ha always use the example of Italy and uh, Berlusconi. Berlusconi was sent away by the financial markets, not by the parliament, not by the judges, not by anybody else. But it was sent away, he was sent away by the financial sector, so the, the financial market. So financial market are also there to enforce good behavior on the, on the governments. It's not, not only that we are to blame, sometimes the governments are to blame, societies to blame at large. And the financial sector is the one who effectively give the warning shots. We have, as financial markets, have made sure that uh, now Europe is much more stringent in its, um, in its budget deficits than it was ever before because the, the parliamentary de democracy was not able uh, to solve this crisis, but the financial markets were. 
So if you are in a party and if you are, get a lot of blame, then you should at least make this point as well. So it is effectively the financial markets are, in that respect, also part of the power balance. So I would like to come to the end of, of my presentation. Uh, the question is if we all believe that m issues around morality are, are important and that they have effectively, that they are a major source of, uh, of the crisis, what, what can we do about it? What should we do in order to uh, make sure that the crisis will not happen again. I think one of the slides I just presented, I skipped it over, but I think it is very important that we have separated three forms of regulations. Prudential, so basically looking at the financial institution and, and look whether, they, uh, whether the financial institution is sound. It's extremely important that we have behavioral um, regulation, AFM, whereby we simply look at the behavior of, of individuals and the company itself, because it is a, effectively a separate source of, uh, of the problem. And certainly, I think that's the issue, is, is looking at systemic risk. Because adding up all our behavior, especially if the behavior is a little bit wrong, or sometimes it's individual behavior is not wrong at all, still can create be a systemic risk. If, if I sell shares, then that's fine. But if we all sell shares, and we all sell the same shares, then there's a systemic risk. So effectively, that is a separate area where you have to look at, because it, it can create problems whereby individually that behavior is, is, is not incorrect. So I think it's very important um, to bring ethics and, and the ability to think of what is good behavior, what is bad behavior, back into uh, to the mainstream business. Um, we have to move away from, from totally rule domination. If you have too many rules, and if we want to, all want to absorb those rules, we simply become moral robots. Moral robots are people who effectively have no mind of their own anymore because they basically can't. They have to read all the rules and they have to interpret all the rules. There's no room left in your, in your brains to think about the, the, the necessity and the need of the rules. So you have to go back to principles, and rules should basically link into, into principles. So a rule which does not relate to a principle should be abandoned. So I think there must, at a point in time, come a very uh, a clean up exercise on rules, and make sure that the rules versus the principle is back in balance. Use empathy as a key tool uh, for confronting the producer, whether in the end of the day he has done the right thing. So now we have a proxy for empathy that is called bonus. If we have done well, then we get a bonus. But in the end of the day, it may well be so that the customer is not very happy. So I think we use empathy and the customer satisfaction, again, as the major that determined uh, whether you deserve to earn a little bit more than your, your colleague because you've done a better job. It's very important to combine internal norms with external norms. There's sometimes um, there are internal norms about uh, how to behave or how not to behave, huh? your, your, your charter in your company or your charter in your, your organization. Uh, but external norms are the norms uh, which the outside world put on you. And that are norms which, the, the best way of formulating it is, is that if something happens to you or your organization, if, um, if, you're, if that next day is on the, financial, financial, uh, the, the front page of the financial daily, can you defend it? Is it something where, where you can get away with by explaining how it has happened? Well, we have a very recent case uh, with one of our auditing, auditing firms. You could argue that what happened to that particular person was okay. But once it is being presented in another light, in another context, can you explain it away, yes or no? And if you, the answer is no, you should, not, you should refrain from it. It has nothing to do with rules. It has to do with how does the outside world perceive you in a po at a point in time, and can you defend it? Uh, apply checks and balances in your organization. Uh, and everybody has to have a boss, even your boss has to have a boss. If your boss doesn't have a boss, then I think there's a tr in trouble. There are examples in the world, uh, and the easiest one is the Roman Catholic Church and the banking institution of the Roman Catholic Church. If you believe you have no boss on earth, but somewhere else, then things can go very badly wrong. So everybody has a boss, even the highest guy in town has to have a boss. Um, 
so I think uh, I would like to conclude with that, but I think then that the, my major uh, important lesson is that, that morality and ethical thinking and, and, and making judgments on dilemmas, because that's what it is, needs to be brought back in, into uh, the financial education and uh, in, in the financial world and, and in your daily education, because it is very important that you learn that to, to happen. Um, one last anecdote, and then I stop. Uh, when I, I was trained as an economist, I effectively left the university, I don't know when, a long time ago. The first thing I got to do was, I worked for the, the Ambro Bank at the time, I was loan officer. I got a sheet on my desk, and on the sheet on my desk, it was co called convenu. And on the sheet on my desk, there were four interest rates, one from Pearson, one from Mason Hope, one from ABN, and one from Amro. And I was told to use those numbers, and if I would not use those numbers, uh, refer to my boss. And I did so. Today, I would be um, handcuffed, taken to prison, because it was it was a um, what do you call it? Um, just forgot the name actually. Um, a cartel. But I never realized it. And it never dawned on me, you know, 10 years later. But so students who come from university tomorrow should know from that day onwards what is right and wrong behavior. And, and I think that is what we haven't learned ourselves. And we learned it basically by creating crisis. Thank you very much.